Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome uh, to our panel entitled Fighting Climate Change While Growing Markets. We have a stellar panel here <laughs> um, to talk about how philanthropy and impact investors do so. We have uh, at my very far right, Susan Finney-Silver from Packet Foundation. Next to her in Kelly Green is <laughs> Sarah Kearney from Prime Coalition. And next to me is John Balbeck from the uh, MacArthur Foundation. I think you have their bios on the app. And as for me, my name is Shilpa Patel and I'm with ClimateWorks Foundation. So we've got a lot of things to talk about today. Let me just set the stage very briefly uh, to put things in context. Uh, we are almost at 2020. Uh, by this time, we should have really bent the emissions curve and be very firmly set on a path to decarbonization. Alas, we are not quite there yet. Um, the UNFCCC estimates that $1.5 trillion will need to be mobilized every year between now and 2030 if we are to meet our climate goals. And frankly, some estimates put that figure higher uh, than $1.5 trillion. So investment in low-carbon, climate-resilient technologies and solutions is a critical part in winning the fight against climate change and ensuring that we can, we, we can adapt, uh, to uh, we can respond to the impacts that climate change uh, will, will, will bring. So the future of our planet, frankly, is uh, riding on this, as I'm sure I don't need to tell you. So, tackling climate change requires actions on multiple fronts. Now, governments can, of course, set the stage uh, with the right policy frame and lead the charge, but the rest of us, the private sector, philanthropy, civil society writ large, must step up uh, to the plate. And multiple levers will need to be activated for climate action. And building markets, the theme of today's panel, is one such lever. So the mobilization of private capital is absolutely essential given the magnitude of the numbers that I've just um, cited. And the use of catalytic capital, such as that provided by philanthropy and impact investors, is critically important. So in this panel, that's really what we're going to talk about, how different types of catalytic support contribute to larger capital uh, mobilization. We're going to touch upon a few live examples of initiatives and activities that the organizations represented here are undertaking to give you a sense of different approaches, the whys and the wherefores. We will definitely leave time for questions, so may I please ask that you hold those uh, to the end. But first, some breaking news. Some of you <laughs> may have seen this, but if not, I'm happy to tell you that the Packard and the MacArthur Foundations have just announced a $90 million facility focused on sustainable land use in and around tropical forests called Terra Silva. And I would really like <laughs> us <laughs> to, to congratulate the heroic efforts of Susan and John in particular that have seen this initiative come to fruition. So I'm going to ask Susan actually to kick us off. Tell us about Terra Silva, how it originated, what it's trying to do. Great, yeah, no, it is a very exciting day today. Um, the, and the origin of Terra Silva really has been over a multi-year period. Um, so these large-scale investor collaborations are not easy or, or, or quick, but um, yeah, that really started uh, a few years ago with some more informal conversations. We at the Packard Foundation have been prioritizing climate for, for all of the reasons that Shilpa <laughs> so well um, laid out, the urgency of it. And so, you know, we had been you know, we've made about $80 million in climate investments. A big focus of that was within the forestry sector. So at the Packard Foundation, we definitely believe one of, you know, the, the main uh, carbon negative technology we have at scale is a tree, right? Our forests. And that that, that really needs to be part of the solution. Um, so we've had a focus on forests and sustainable climate smart forestry for many years. Um, 
about seven to 10 years, we've been making these investments. And I think we have a number of individual investments that we've been proud of, but it became increasingly clear to us that we were, these individual investments just were not gonna move the needle. And that many of these fund managers, and, and you all probably know of a lot of these, that have been just you know, heroically trying to raise capital for years, really languishing, not getting to a viable point. Um, and so it just was a thought process, what can we do about that? We obviously need to go bigger than what we are doing on our own. Uh, and that's when a, a fortuitous moment came along, which is in a conversation with the MacArthur Foundation in the early days, and I'll let John in a minute talk about that, of what has become their C3 initiative, um, a discussion started about could we do something on a collaborative basis that could really go a lot bigger. Um, so we joined for forces, um, and I think, um, you know, it's been a road, it's, it's Again, designing collaborative, <laughs> big, large-scale collaboratives has not been easy, but um, yeah, really happy to say that to be at this point now that we're launching into the market as of today, um, that the goal is to have $90 million of blended capital that goes into um, preserving and restoring tropical forests, into promoting climate-smart agriculture and forestry practices in and around those tropical forests, and to engaging communities and sharing the benefits with the communities to create long-term solutions around those tropical forests. So that's, that's um, what Terra Silva will do, but it will do it at a scale that none of us could have done alone. So the idea is that it will invest in eight, uh, go, uh, the target is eight to 10 fund managers and intermediaries. So enough of a stable that Terra Silva can be an early, you know, often mm -hmm. s significant scale investor to both um, launch and kickstart and signal to bring in capital and to really get a stable of these fund managers with the pretty ambitious goal then of really trying to get to the point of an asset class, of you know, a stable of these fund managers that investors, commercial investors could then come in, benchmark, have comps, have really an asset class to invest in. Thank you, Susan. So I think one of the themes that comes through very clearly from what you've said is this whole idea of collaboration, that together we're stronger than if we just go about something alone. So John, actually, that leads me to come to you about MacArthur's Catalytic Capital uh, Consortium, is it? Consortium, yeah, yeah. Yes. Three C. I'm never quite sure what the three C stand <laughs> for. But um, can you tell us more about C3 and why you're so excited about Terra Silva? I think it's one of your first initiatives, first or second initiatives second in initiative, the C3 yes. uh, pantheon. Yeah, no, happy to do that. Thank you, Shilpa, and, and thanks, Susan, for your leadership on, on this, mm -hmm. this initiative. Uh, so two things I wanted to start with. Uh, the first is I want to take a moment to, to thank the good folks at SOCAP for elevating catalytic capital as, as part of this year's conference. Uh, it's obviously an issue we care a lot about and really happy that, that they made this a focus of, of this year's conference. And along those lines, I also wanted to thank uh, the team at Mission Investors Exchange, mm -hmm. who uh, just did Herculean work in, in helping to develop the content and build the panels for uh, for this catalytic capital track. So just wanted to make sure I made those yeah. two points. So at, at MacArthur, as Shilpa said, we've, we've been thinking a lot about catalytic capital. We've been thinking about how catalytic capital is essential to extending the reach of impact investing, how this moment in time is absolutely critical to try to shine, to try to shine a light on this really critical uh, investing tool. And as we were thinking about that, uh, we were inspired by, uh, by a number of things. We were inspired by the Omidyar Network and the work that they've done to, to really flesh out and frame out the full continuum of capital and then to take the extra step to really shine a light on the importance of that continuum of capital through their work with Beyond Tradeoffs. We were inspired by the Rockefeller Foundation and the work that they've done to, uh, to really accelerate uh, in innovative financial mechanisms that have enormous potential to close the SDG funding gaps uh, to the point where we wanted to think about how we could provide scale and extend the reach of, of their important work. And we were inspired by Susan's leadership and, and the work at the, the Packard Foundation. Uh, we were inspired by their vision, by their expertise, and by their, their ambition around climate and specifically around this, this uh, investing activity that they've been pursuing for nearly a decade now around sustainable forestry. All of that inspiration, among other things, led us 
to, to want to launch an initiative in partnership with Rockefeller and Omidyar uh, called the Catalytic Capital Consortium. That initiative's goal is, is to increase knowledge, awareness, and use of catalytic capital. Uh, and, and through that initiative, MacArthur has committed to invest up to 150 million in what we are describing as powerful examples of catalytic capital. And, and really, uh, I think it's important to note that the, the work that we had done prior to launching the initiative and that ultimately led to the announcement of our zero gap in investment in March, as well as the work that was under development with Terra Silva at the time of our announcement, were very inspirational to us in, in launching this initiative and then ultimately creating an invitational proposal process that, uh, that uh, provided over 100 proposals that we're now in the process of reviewing and hope to make announcements around that proposal pool uh, for these powerful demonstrations in, in the first half of, of 2020. We think Terra Silva is a powerful example of catalytic capital. We think that for a number of reasons. Uh, the first is it addresses a really critical ca capital gap. That capital gap is providing uh, uh, a meaningful and demonstrable track record for managers that are, that are subscale. Uh, that lack of a track record for these uh, potentially uh, market, marketable uh, funds uh, that have the ability to scale, it's, it's impeding capital from hitting this really critical sector. And so that's an enormous capital gap and, and a really great use of, of catalytic capital. Secondly, as Shilpa noted, this is an incredibly consequential uh, social impact area. And just to, to put a really fine point on it, there is, there is no rational climate future without sustainable forestry. Uh, I think just, just full stop. Uh, so this is an incredibly consequential impact area. And then lastly, the, the intervention is systemic in nature. So again, this, addressing this particular capital gap helps to build a foundation that, uh, that could create the, the, the foundation for an asset class that then can proceed without the, the need and use of, of catalytic capital. So that, that's what Omidyar describes as market level impact, and we see that uh, enormous potential here with this. And that idea of capital gaps, that's, that's what's critical for us with, with catalytic capital. This gap that, that Terra Silva is addressing is a critical one. There are other gaps like uh, the, uh, addressing the innovation gap, which you'll hear Sarah talk about in, in a bit. There's uh, trying to reach underserved people uh, and very challenging places, places that have things like political instability, fragile states, and, and there's the, the ability to, to pierce very challenging business models, uh, business models that often have high transaction costs. Catalytic capital is essential to addressing all of these challenges in order to seed, scale, and sustain social impact. That's why we think it's so important, and, and we think Terra Silva is a really terrific example of, of this tool. Thank you, John, and thank you for setting the stage for what's going to come next, which is what I'd like to turn to. I'd like to, I mean, I'm sure we could spend a lot more time talking about Terra Silva, but we've got other things to talk about. So I'd like to broaden uh, our discussion to the use of different types of philanthropic support or catalytic support across this continuum uh, of capital, which goes from grant making, you know, from, from grants through PRI, MRI, and then of course market rate um, uh, investment. So I'd like to now turn to this the initiative that, uh, that, that John alluded to or referred to earlier, the innovation gap for climate solutions, um, which I think will illustrate this use of different types of capital at different stages. So I'm referring to Prime, and um, I don't know, John, if you wanted to say a quick word about the importance of grant making in building markets, or shall we just go to Sarah and have her, have her tell us in her <laughs> words? I'm happy to do just a quick intro, but I really want to hear what, <laughs> what you have to say. Um, so, so again, we're, we're really laser focused on catalytic capital, but we also recognize that grants are, are a really critical component of, of the overall landscape when you're, you're thinking about building markets. Uh, and, and we see them as helping to either facilitate uh, catalytic capital investing and market building or working alongside that, that activity. And just a few quick examples uh, of, of ways that, that this can work. So, so grants can, can provide really effective operational support 
for, for funds where uh, that's, that's required. Um, it can, uh, they can help to develop tools. And so Sarah is working on uh, a, a really important tool in our mind uh, that, uh, that called the Crane tool, which is, uh, which is looking at uh, quantifying the potential emission reduction for uh, early stage technology for, for clean energy and resource efficiency. Those types of tools funded by grants working alongside investing activities, really important and, and, and effective, uh, effective use of grants. Technical assistance is another, and this is something that we saw uh, really hit home for us as we were re reviewing the, the proposal pool that, that came through for uh, the, the Catalytic Capital Consortium. Uh, and that's a, this is especially true in, uh, in emerging markets and uh, those efforts that are addressing the missing middle gap for uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. But technical assistance combined with investing activity is, is a really effective use of, of grant funding. Uh, and then the last one I would, I would emphasize is something called project preparation. And this is an effort that, that Shilpa and I have worked together on around our work in India where we helped catalyze uh, a grant pool of, of, of funding uh, called the US India Clean Energy Finance Facility that's, uh, that's targeting those, uh, those uh, uh, efforts that are right on the cusp of very significant pools of, of uh, capital, helping to use grants to move them over the diligence finish line uh, and catalyze significant pools of capital. That initiative was launched in 2017. It's already catalyzed over 100 million for, uh, for uh, distributed generation renewable energy efforts in India. And that's, I think, a really effective and powerful use of grants. And then the last thing I would say is grants can be effective in providing early support to help move things to, to, to move efforts to investability. We were incredibly proud to support the, the Prime Coalition uh, uh, five years ago, I think, at, the, at this time, uh, and made a bet on, on Sarah's leadership and her vision and couldn't be more pleased with, with what's developed since then. And, and I think that's maybe a good segue to, to turn it over to you and what, what you're doing. All right, hi everyone. My name is Sarah Carney. I am psyched to be on this panel because <laughs> as Shilpa said, we have a $1 trillion gap a year that on top of business as usual that we need in order to reach our climate goals. And as I'm sitting here listening about Tara, Tara Silver, which is, Terra Silva, which is very, diverges from what Prime does, but it's in climate, it's a yes and everything. We need carbon negative solutions. We need technology innovation. We need to deploy solutions in places that matter. We need to reduce annual greenhouse gas emissions by 70 gigatons annually by 2050, and all wind power ever deployed is equivalent to one gigaton, so 70 times all wind power ever. Um, so it just feels very exciting to be talking about catalytic capital that can crowd in that $1 trillion gap. Um, that's just how I'm feeling sitting here listening to y'all <laughs> talk about things. Um, so five years ago, I founded a 501c3 nonprofit public charity called Prime Coalition. Uh, we now have offices in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I work, and also down the street here at Two Embarcadero in San Francisco. And we have benefited from philanthropic partnership in many of the ways that John mentioned since our founding in 2014. Prime partners with philanthropists to place catalytic capital capital into market-driven solutions to climate change. So that means we place catalytic capital into extraordinary for-profit companies that combat climate change, are attractive to follow-on market rate investors and have a real chance to achieve commercial scale, but would be challenged to raise su sufficient financial support without catalytic capital. So imagine a conservative East Coast community foundation like the Boston Foundation supporting an engineer who's developing better membranes for water desalination. Or imagine a corporate foundation like Autodesk supporting innovators that are improving air conditioning solutions. Or maybe the Will and Jada Smith Foundation who's supporting improvements to industrial freezing infrastructure. Since our founding, we've mobilized over $60 million across 13 companies. It really feels like we're just getting started. 
and we have a three-phase, 10-year plan for unlocking philanthropic capital for climate change mitigation, and so we're almost done with the fundraising period of phase two. Um, I founded Prime based on my own experience serving as executive director and trustee of the Chisonas Family Foundation based in Rochester, New York, and my graduate research in systems engineering at MIT. The first thing that we did in 2014 was a listening tour where we traveled around and we talked to hundreds of different types of philanthropists, large institutional foundations, smaller family offices, individuals using donor-advised funds, and we asked them uh, whether they knew that this capital gap existed for early stage climate innovators and ask them whether they knew that they had tools to step in and help fill that gap and what would make that fun or what would be very difficult about that. And as you can imagine, we came out of that exercise with a laundry list of reasons that this was gonna be prohibitively difficult for any one organization to do on their own. And today, I think of those barriers in three buckets. The first is educational, the second is operational, and the third is perceived regulatory barriers. Um, so to start on educational, uh, what we heard back were people asking questions like, isn't this what venture capital does? So we knew we had some work to do around really characterizing the capital gap. And then next, operational barriers. We met very, very few grant-making organizations that were organizationally structured to behave like a venture capital firm to do the deal sourcing, due diligence, very deep technical due diligence, structure terms to, to achieve the impact goals later and crowd in market rate investment. And then to serve on boards of directors of early stage technology companies is just not something that most grant-making organizations are set up to do. And then lastly, it's nearly impossible as a single actor to argue this counterfactual, whether you're trying to establish charitability for one company or for a fund, to say this investment would not be made but for the charitable purpose is a very difficult argument to make without surveying a majority of the market rate investment community. So we built Prime as a public charity to try to bring these high barriers down to zero and start to unlock catalytic capital. So um, we came up with this 10-year plan and we celebrated our fifth exemption determination birthday in September. Um, that's when the IRS gave us permission to do all three of these phases. And as I said before, we're almost wrapped up with fundraising for period two um, and we're on track to start exploration for phase three in the early part of 2020. So the purpose of phase one for us was to explore the boundaries of what you're allowed to do with charitable capital. And during that phase, Prime mobilized 23 million dollars from 54 philanthropic organizations to support 10 companies and each one of these companies holds promise for gigaton scale CO2 equivalent emissions reduction really big game-changing ideas uh, the purpose of phase two where we are now is to prove that catalytic capital will show up at meaningful scale um, that's in the tens of millions of dollars toward high risk high impact reward uh, ideas and the Prime Impact Fund is now operating as a $40 million seed fund, um, and it's designed to be unabashedly, purposefully impact first. Our phase three long-term goal is to pioneer a blended finance strategy that combines philanthropic, catalytic, and market rate capital. And our modeling shows that with all three of these different colors of money working together, everyone achieves their goals more effectively. And we hope that by doing that, we can unlock financing for everything along the innovation to deployment pipeline for climate change mitigation. Because at Prime, we have one goal. It's to reduce greenhouse gas emissions at gigaton scale. So ultimately, our success will be measured by the tons of CO2 equivalent emissions uh, avoided by our companies, but we do have some nearer term key performance indicators. Um, we don't just care about the number of catalytic capital investors that have done investment transactions with us, but we also care about how many of them were first time philanthropic investors or first time climate investors. And so, so far we've done transactions with 121 philanthropic organizations and 42 of them had never used a program related investment or a recoverable grant before and 35 had never, grant or investment, done anything in energy or climate before. So it makes us feel like we're, we're 
achieving our goal of uh, expanding the group of asset owners that are active in the space and not just dividing the pie among the usual suspects. So just for a little bit more detail and then I'll stop. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. We have four different types of investors, private foundations, donor advised funds, families slash family offices slash trusts, and corporate giving programs. And there's four ways that partners jump in with Prime. They use traditional grants, recoverable grants, program related investments, and concessionary mission investments. So in our $40 million seed fund um, called Prime Impact Fund, we've had 57 distinct contributions. 24 individuals and families using donor advised funds, 20 foundations, and 13 individuals, family offices, and trusts. And 18% of that dollar-wise has come in as traditional grants, 31% as recoverable grants, 25% as program-related investments, and 26% as concessionary mission investments. So in terms of how we do our work, we have three simple investment criteria. We're looking for US-based companies that hold promise for half a gigaton or more of CO2 equivalent emissions reduction potential. We believe they have a chance to, commercial, uh, to achieve commercial scale, which means they actually might achieve that climate impact. And we um, have assessed that they are going to have a difficult time raising sufficient financial support without us. And I'm, the thing I'm most proud of about Prime is, is the rigor that we've put into our system for evaluating each of those very complex investment criteria. So on the commercial attractiveness piece, we've been able to attract not only best-in-class investment managers, but like the best <laughs> that we possibly could with a, tra a proven track record in venture capital um, investment managers that just happen to have the climate mission in their heart. Um, Secondly, to establish additionality, we have an investment advisory committee of 18 of the most active and historically successful market rate venture firms in our space. And they meet quarterly for us to not only say, yes, if this company makes it to a certain milestone, we would be thrilled to invest, but also here are the specific reasons that I would have a hard time convincing my partners to do this today. So that gives us conviction that not only does it achieve additionality, but it's for good reasons and not bad reasons. And then lastly, as John mentioned earlier, we've developed this in-house methodology for assessing emissions reduction potential, or as we say, ERP, we do ERPs all the time, um, for each company that we're thinking about investing in. And it turns out that's a really, really hard labor-intensive thing for any investor to do. And so we've been generously supported by the MacArthur Foundation um, and the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, NYSERDA, and the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center to take the methodology we were already using to do our emissions reduction potential calculations and turn it into an online free software tool for any investor that might want to might want to consider climate impacts in their investment decision making, whether they're doing that today or not. Um, so it's called Crane. Maybe we can talk about that later if you're interested. But for now, I'll just wrap up by saying that it's a real privilege to sit up here with three of Prime's philanthropic partners and kind of displaying three different ways to partner with us. So as John said before, he and his team at MacArthur were early, absolutely critical general operating supporters when they made a multi-year general operating grant commitment in 2015. Um, and then he and his team also supported the Crane Project for the benefit not only of Prime, but the whole field to assess climate impact in your investment decision making. Um, and that was a project grant in 2018. And then lastly, it's been really educational for our investment team to work with Susan's team at Packer that has been doing PRI making for many years and to sharpen our presentation for catalytic capital commitments to Prime Impact Fund um, and to look forward uh, together around the exploration of potential blended fund uh, concepts that could combine philanthropic, catalytic, and market rate investment in the years ahead. Thank you, Sarah. So Susan, j just to sort of complete the circle yeah. in terms of your involvement, I believe Packard has also 
uh, or is, is about to make an, another interesting announcement or has yes. already made the announcement, <laughs> so please tell us. Yes, no, we are pleased to announce that uh, in September, our board approved uh, investment in the Prime Impact Fund. So we are very pleased to be joining the group of investors. And I just want to um, <laughs> underscore just, uh, again, the early grant support from MacArthur and others that really got this to the point where, you know, it could become an investment for us. Um, I will say this is a first for us. It's our first venture equity investment. So that, you know, again, another Terra Silva <laughs> is a first in a different way. This one is, is really a first, and we're really um, excited about that, and we're trying to um, really lean in in our uh, climate change. And I would say um, what the early grant support was really able to do in terms of being able to uh, support Prime to get to the point where an investor like ourselves could step in is really to develop the, the track record, the, the, the capacity of you know, Sarah and her staff to, to evaluate these technologies and the rigorous, as you're hearing about, um, methodology that they've created for that. I just think what really got it to a point of really being our, on our radar screen. Um, you know, Sarah talked about the three obstacles. For us, you know, having you know, 10 years of, of climate investing, the, the number one and three, I think it was the, the educational and the um, the regulatory weren't issues for us, but I will say that the second that you said, the operational, even for a very experienced climate investor, is a huge barrier. And, you know, we, because we're a foundation that cares about climate change and really cares about science, many of you know the Packard Science Fellows, the science is very in our DNA, and so we get lots of inbound um, you know, ideas and really promising ideas, but we are just not technology pickers. So um, it just was, has always been clear to us that these, th there could be like the answer to climate change could be in one of these inbound, but we just don't have the capacity to evaluate it well. So it's just been very gratifying to now be able to partner with Prime that does have that <laughs> capacity and has, has really um, done a great job of building that out. So we're just really, um, really excited to join the fold and to, uh, to look at these really exciting carbon mitigating technologies. That's wonderful. And I'm very conscious that, you know, time is really flowing by and I do want to leave time for questions uh, from the audience. But can I just ask John very, very briefly, can you, you and I have worked together on rooftop solar financing in India. And can you just tell our audience how the foundation consortium that you lead is tackling the financing gaps in that market? Sure, and so just Very to, briefly, yes, I want to leave time I, I for will, questions. I will, I will be brief. So, um, and just to be clear for everyone, this is not the Catalytic Capital Consortium, and so this is yeah. a small group of funders uh, that includes the Packard Foundation and Climate Works Foundation, got together a, a few years ago to, to, to see if we could uh, uh, address climate ambition in, in a specific place, and that place is India. Place matters, and, and, and India really matters when you look at... Uh, uh, what we're trying to achieve from a global climate ambition perspective. Uh, and when we got together, we, we tried to, to think about how we could help uh, in a, a small way to, to move and, and develop the market for uh, distributed generation uh, and, and renewable energy, distributed generation solar and renewable energy. And to do that, we looked at a very specific, or we identified a very specific capital gap. And that capital gap is in down market, so, uh, so small and medium-sized enterprise rooftop solar, uh, and it's a, a really uh, important element to the broader market building component of, of what's happening in India. So capital is flowing at a large scale, at utility scale, at large scale commercial, but it's, it's blocked as you move into this, this down market phase of, uh, of the rooftop solar market in India. So to address this, our collaboration designed a, a series of interventions uh, that span the spectrum from grant making uh, all the way to, to uh, full on impact investing. On a grant making perspective, the, the US India Clean Energy Finance Facility that I mentioned earlier, that was the sort of core intervention. Shilpa led uh, an effort to design uh, a, a recoverable grant that supported the launch of a purpose-built financial intermediary that's addressing this, this particular gap. And then MacArthur, along with a couple of our other partners, made uh, an anchor and foundational commitment into a fund called Encourage Solar 
That fund will ultimately be a 75 to $100 million fund, and it will invest into the Indian financial system through what are called non-banking finance companies, or NBFCs, as a way to effectively channel capital towards this, this capital gap. And for us, this is really exciting, but also important because it's a systemic intervention. We're working within the system, and we're, we're, we're using these different levers to, to try to, to move uh, a solution around this, this really important gap in, in India. So, so essentially, the India work has involved basically various types of interventions, various types of catalytic support to address gaps at different levels um, in the market, but mostly to nascent uh, companies or entities that are new to the space. Um, Susan, you folks at New Forest have been involved in something a little bit at the other end of the spectrum, which is working with a very established entity to deepen impact. Can you very briefly give us a few sentences on that. Sure, sure, yeah, because it, it is sort of a different kind of catalytic capital. Um, and it's, it's also a first, uh, another first. Uh, so again, theme of 2019, really trying to stretch on climate change investing. Um, so this one is our first MRI. And I think what is really different about it is that, you know, almost all of our portfolio to date has been in trying to take early stage risks, try to go and build emerging and nascent fund managers and intermediaries and get them to scale uh, to scale climate solutions. And so that's really um, what our entire portfolio, and in Terra Silva, that's what it's about with the <laughs> Sustainable Forestry Fund Managers Prime, with the, the, the ventures, uh, the technology ventures. So um, I think what happened in our uh, partnership with New Forest is we uh, asked ourselves the question, could we go the other way? <laughs> so could we work with an entity that was already at scale? Uh, and so New Forest with, you know, billions of dollars of forestry assets under management, uh, tropical uh, forests under ma management, um, approached us and I think became, a, an, I think, a, a really good and interesting conversation where we, s we sought to see could we pilot this idea of working with a fund manager at scale but, tr but finding a way to drive deeper sustainability and trying to do that in a meaningful way. So what ensued was a long conversation and design process um, where we created a, what, what's, what we're calling an impact tranche. And the idea of an impact tranche is that if New Forest can uh, deepen its sustainability on very specific benchmarks. And that's where I was uh, uh, very grateful to be teamed up. I think Belinda Morris might even be just right there. <laughs> here. Um, so really, uh, thanks to Belinda Morris, who was our climate and land use program officer, deep sector expertise, was really to go, because the devil's in the details of if uh, we really wanted to create something that was driving meaningful, measurable, impacts that were accountable and that were, and the important part, that were beyond the business as usual. So, you know, with New Forest, there were carbon impacts, there were community working with tribes, but we really um, were looking at, we will reduce our financial return if New Forest can demonstrate these really, uh, these documented both, whether they're biodiversity or carbon, or with, with get, sharing benefits with communities. Um, if they can document those, then we would take the reduced return. So, uh, and that, again, importantly, we're beyond their business as usual. So really, the, uh, the idea was to be able to essentially drive a new business as usual. So it's basically giving them a really strong performance uh, incentive. A performance in a incentive to include these deeper, yeah, performance and then on the hopefully the side. next fund that New Forest would do would have this as part of their business as usual for future funds. So yeah. that's the, the yeah. thesis. So Sarah, and literally a minute and a half, please. <laughs> well, uh -oh. I'll do, I'll do, uh -oh. uh, yes. <laughs> you're, you're also thinking about a gap uh, in your portfolio company, something that you call first plant risk. What is first plant risk and how are you planning to address it? So this is something, you know, Prime was purpose built specifically around one capital gap that we spent years characterizing. And it's the earliest stages of company formation as something moves from say a nonprofit university lab into the commercial marketplace. It forms as a for-profit company for the first time. Maybe there's a 
you know, one person on the team. It's a really tenuous time, especially for, for any early stage venture, but especially for hardware that can make a big difference on uh, CO2 equivalent emissions reduction. What we have heard from our own portfolio, from many, many other investors in the field, is that a very similar acute capital gap exists when those types of companies, you know, maybe they get through their seed round, series A, series B, series C, and then they get to a place where they need to build their first facility. And imagine a manufacturing facility that wants to use a new solution rather than the decades old equipment norms. And it is impossible for them to raise the money to build that first plant because like the, the disproportionate risk that market rate investors cannot accept at the earliest stages of company formation, there are risks that market rate investors just cannot accept. And so we're very interested within the vertical of climate change mitigation to spend some time in an exploration period um, characterizing that capital gap, um, exploring what is the scope of the projects in the pipeline that are falling into that gap, how would you design an intervention that kind of minimally requires catalytic capital to crowd in lots of market rate um, capital, because as you can imagine, as you get further along and want to build plants and large you know, chemical processing facilities, the dollars get bigger and bigger. Um, but it is something that we know is also a, a friction point for things that could really advance our climate change mitigation goals. Great. Well, I did promise uh, some time for questions, and that time has now come. I do hope you have <laughs> questions. And if you do, please raise your hand and stand. I believe that there are a couple of roving mics uh, one of which will be brought to you so that we can all hear you. So, do, do I have any questions? Yes, uh, right there. Hi, uh, I'm gonna, you... sorry, ju just before you start, I'd like to take two or three questions in one go so we can make more efficient use of our time. I'll come to, the gentleman here will be next. Go ahead, please. Hi, uh, my name is Asha Jareja from the uh, Motwani Foundation. We're a family foundation based here in Palo Alto. And uh, I've been working actually in India quite a lot on on, uh, on a whole bunch of initiatives. And I'm just realizing that a lot of the companies that I'm seeing there, which are in, could be you know creating solar power, you know torches or cooking stoves and so on, or roofing material, they don't uh, seem to have. Um, I mean, they they cannot. They're not yet ripe for venture capital. So is that? And I'm seeing so many promising uh, companies there, which really have actually already have a lot of traction. Typically, I end up investing a little bit in, in, in seed investing as a foundation, and I use a PRI. I'm just learning all these, you know, mechanisms now. But I'm, I'm wondering if you guys are interested in sort of, you know, like proactively suggesting what are you looking for, because there are just tons and, you know, I mean, I've been venture cap I'm a venture capitalist, and I've been venture capital for, for, for about 20 years now. So uh, I, I have lined up a sort of a, a battery of people in India that I know can solve a few things uh, very quickly if we could if we could just get focused around certain you know like and I'm using the X Prize model you know the for really just getting a larger footprint of people coming through. Uh, how do I how do I get to talk to you guys after this or something? And I'll just thank you. <laughs> could I take the question here? Yes, please. Thank you so much for your commitment and just for the enthusiasm that is just radiating off the stage because if there is something we need in this great struggle, it is a stack of enthusiasm, so thank you. Um, look, I just wanted to ask you a question about leverage of a different kind. Um, we often tend to think of impact investment and philanthropic investment in advocacy and activism as if they're two quite different things. But if there's something we know about the political economy of the fossil fuel industry, it's that there's a leverage that comes from the advocacy that follows from having the economic stake. And so I'm wondering if you've got some things to say about the, the relationship between the kind of impact investment that you're talking about and how that commitment can also be parlayed into political advocacy. Thank you. Do I have another question? Hi. My name is Olivier Siberio. Uh, I'm working for a company called Resolute Marine, and we are developing a wave-driven desalination system. 
And I really resonate with just what you just said, Sarah, about the first plant issue. We are at the stage where we are trying to develop our first plant and we are committing, we, we are finding this to be a very difficult challenge to cross. And so we are looking for creative solutions to manage to cross this gap. And within the reach of what we can do, we look at exploratory solutions such as bundling an equity investment in our company and a future investment in project finance or offering right, uh, right uh, first uh, first right of offer, of, I'm sorry, um, uh, for the next five years, I would say, of development. But I'm very curious in your exploratory research, do you have uh, thoughts that you would be willing to share or how, mobilize, how to mobilize other stakeholders that could uh, collaborate with us in crossing this threshold and what would would you advise us, I would say, what kind of way would you advise us to explore and what kind of partner you would like us to go through? Well. Thank you. This, this is a, a lot to <laughs> handle in, in, in five minutes, but essentially I think there's a couple of questions related to how do you get early stage companies, how, how do you get them this capital that they need, that they can, you know, do the first plant, cover the first plant risk, but even before the first plant risk, to sort of get them to a stage where they are able to have something that they can go and, and sell. So that's, that's um, one question. I don't know uh, which of you, perhaps Sarah, or, or is, is, is best placed to to tackle that. I'll start with the last one first. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll start with the last one. Actually, I might tie the yeah, first one and the last yeah, one. That's what okay. I think, yeah. That um, so, to, just to address the first question about geographic scope of this type of solution, there's no regulatory reason that you couldn't have a prime India or a prime Europe. We've had a lot of, um, or a prime China. We've had a lot of uh, families based in those other geographies that are like, please do a prime franchise. And so there's no uh, tax reasons you couldn't do that. We've made the strategic choice to stay constrained to the US for the reason that will bring us back to this question, which is to be good investors. It's just at this stage, we felt that having oceans between us and these very, very nascent teams um, made us less able to do our job well of helping to build thriving, lasting companies. But um, I would love to see copycats in other places. To answer your question, that's exactly what you need. You need experienced industry veterans helping, to, helping young teams build their businesses hand in hand. Uh, my colleagues often say, you're not an investor, you're like a talent scout with a checkbook at this early stage. Um, and then back to your question around um, how do you access the type of catalytic capital that we're talking about at the first plant risk stage, I, I think that my colleagues on stage would agree with me that the power of intermediation cannot be overstated. This is something that I constantly have to uh, tell entrepreneurs, even at the earlier stage, it's like one company going to MacArthur or Packard is, is not kind of what's gonna work for the catalytic capital community. Um, they're looking for systems change. Um, and so, you know, those that can do the knitting together of many catalytic capital asset owners in a, from a systems perspective um, to do the vetting of because what what's hard for them is that they're inundated with pitches like that. And as Susan was saying earlier, it's hard to do the sorting exercise of saying, here are the things that are going to be supported by market rate capital. Here's the very large set of things that are not going to be funded. But among them, here are the things that won't be successful. And here's this Venn diagram middle slice of things that really could work, but won't otherwise be funded. And so you need kind of the entity to help with that macro sorting exercise to sit in the middle. Um, and just one last thing, kind of back to the first question, um, for us choosing to be US constrained, we have over 4,000 companies in our pipeline from pre-seed to series B. Um, and I imagine the same would be true of uh, first plant risk um, type projects. And so you kind of have to put yourself in their position of like, <laughs> how do we sort through all of that and, and pick the things, this, this capital is so precious, you really want it to go to the highest and best use to advance the most impactful toward the impact goal. And that's a very hard exercise to do when you're being expected to sort through everything in the world at every, in every asset class. And uh, it's not our expertise. Absolutely, I mean. <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Let me come to the, other, the, 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 the second question that we had, which is essentially this notion of leverage, which includes 
you know, uh, investment, if you will, in advocacy or in policy reform that make the, sub the, the actual financial investment that will come later uh, fruitful or even possible. Do you, would you like to, to address how foundations, how, how your foundations are looking at this? Well, I, I'm happy to, to jump in. Did, did you want to jump in first? I or? could, either way. Go ahead. I'll okay, because I, be, uh, I may be briefer, because I don't know if I... Uh, <laughs> John, well, I, not because John's not brief, but because <laughs> John, I think, spans an interesting between their grant making and their investing, is, is, is oh. why. Um, <laughs> I think that um, for the Packard Foundation, I know um, that is definitely the tying together of the grant making around policy work and, and regulatory regimes um, is definitely seen as seeding uh, seeding the ground for our investments. I would say it also works the other way, that I think that when we're making a lot of our investments, we really see that we are trying to prove out so that, you know, to make regulatory regimes more likely and viable by showing that it can be done. So I think it works both ways. And maybe just to build off that, I wanted to build off of one thing that, that Sarah said as well around the importance of community with early stage technology and, and sort of early stage venture development. Um, to, to get early stage companies off the ground, it takes a number of things. It takes technology, it takes capital, it takes talent and it takes networks. And people always jump to the capital and they think <laughs> it's just the capital issue when really some of the hardest things are the talent and the network. And so building those uh, in, in ways, and that's a great use of, of grant funding. I, I just wanted to echo that, that point that, that Sarah um, made. Um, on the point of connecting advocacy and advoca activism, I would, I would start by saying, we as private foundations have to be careful about the use of the word advocacy. Um, but but what, we, what we would say is, at least from our perspective, um, uh, within the context of what we're talking about here, uh, the, the term ambition, I think, uh, really matters. And so within the Catalytic Capital Consortium, um, we, are, are, we are clearly stating that we're trying to do demonstration investments. And those investments, by, by definition, are demonstrating the use of this tool so that others will follow. And that's uh, our, our, our really, that's a, a core premise for what we're trying to, to achieve. Uh, and, and, the, and so there is an element of trying to influence uh, around that through the demonstrations. And I think that's, uh, that's really important. And I think similarly, that idea of uh, trying to do things on a larger scale with uh, the, the, the climate work uh, so that it, it shines a light on the importance of, uh, of, of that activity. Uh, and then the last thing, I just echo what, what Susan said, uh, that um, the, uh, the types of investing that we're doing, that, that we're pursuing, can absolutely influence policy reform. And, and one great example through the Terra Silva uh, investment is uh, payment for ecosystem services. And there's, there's an important policy element of this, but, but somebody needs to come in and do the early investments to show that these work. And that influences policy, policy reforms then incur, that, uh, occur that help to make that activity more amenable to markets and it, and it moves forward from there. And so I think that's uh, a great example through the work that Susan led of, of, of how investing can help to influence policy. Uh, I'm going to, I need to bring this panel to a close, but before I do, I want each one of you to please just give me one thought, literally one thought, not a long sentence, please, <laughs> <laughs> that, that you want, what do you want this audience to remember? Uh, what, what is it that you, you know, what is one thought you want to leave them with, something that they can think about on all this work? I guess my one thought would be, now is the time to be bold and to really push ourselves in to do new and different kinds of investments in our fight against climate change. That's a great, that's a, that, that's, that's great. And Sarah. I, I followed the rules too. You did. <laughs> I'm going to break the rules. do a compound sentence. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of clauses. Um, okay. <laughs> So I have three things. I'm breaking the rules. Um, first, because I'm on stage with Climate Works, MacArthur, and Packard, uh, it feels important for me to say that you don't have to be a large institutional foundation to jump mm. in on catalytic capital for climate. 
We have plenty of small staff foundations, corporate giving programs, individual DAF sponsors and donors, and families that are a part of our tribe. That's one. Two, please visit cranetool.org if you want to be a beta user for our beta period from November to February. Uh, we want input from all SOCAP-minded people um, to incorporate climate into your investment consideration. And then third, we're going to be kickstarting our exploration period for the blended fund uh, in 2020. And so we're, just, we're starting to get a handle on the philanthropic and catalytic pieces. We are very interested to talk to you if you are a market rate asset owner, long-term viewpoint with constituents that care about climate. And we want to talk to you about what would make you excited or hesitant to be in the same vehicle with philanthropic and catalytic capital. You did break the rules, Sarah, but those were three very good Thank points. <laughs> John. I'm going to do a compound sentence no, no, as no, well. No, no, no. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> is that okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so three really quick points. So one is, is uh, embrace the full continuum of capital. Invest across the full continuum of capital. Second is, uh, just to pick up on what was said earlier, this is an all-in approach. Uh, this isn't uh, only do technology, only do uh, sustainable forestry, it's, it's all in and, and it all has to happen in, in parallel. And the last thing is to, to really achieve what we're, we're trying to achieve, we have to be willing to collaborate and to collaborate in a way where we are willing to stand behind the leadership of others. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's essential. Okay, so that just leaves me a minute uh, to try and summarize the hour, which you will, I hope, agree is, is, is impossible. But let me just give you my takeaways, um, and I'll try to just hit them one after the next. So first, grant capital is critical in building early stage innovations or to get projects to investability. We saw that with the India Clean Energy Facility. We saw that with Prime. Second, the venture capital valley of death is all too real and needs to be addressed, as Prime is trying to do. Third, sometimes you need to build a new asset class to crowd in private capital for emerging fund managers, as Terra Silva uh, is trying to do. And finally, at the very end of that continuum that I alluded to earlier, you can incentivize deeper impacts for fund managers who are already at scale, as we saw with New Forest. With that, I am out of time, but please join me in thanking this wonderful panel for a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.